Since I arrived at River Cottage, I've seen the leaves break bud, grow fat and green, and start to drop. My garden has gone from nothing to abundance and is fast heading back to nothing again. But throughout the cycle of the seasons, one thing has remained constant, the river that gave my small holding its name. Its eddies and ripples have been a source of comfort and inspiration. But it's about time it started pulling its weight. One thing the river hasn't done for me yet is feed me. And to be honest, it's not exactly heaving with fish. But there is one creature who I'm sure is lurking around here somewhere. He's very tasty. I haven't seen him yet. But if he is around, now's the time to catch him. Because this is the season of the eel migration. For generations, people in Dorset have been trapping the mature eels as they head down to the sea to spawn. This year, I'm determined to get a piece of the action with my very own eel trap. I've got local basket maker Malcolm Seal in on the experiment. He's never made an eel trap before, but he's tracked down an 18th century French design. And if it's good enough for the mighty Loire, then it should clean up in the humble Brit. Well, it looks beautiful. I mean, really lovely. Are you happy with it? Yeah, I'm happy with it. But is it going to catch any eels? Well, let's hope so. I love, I think that the, the funnels are looking great and the chamber's a good size. Just thinking maybe an eel might get yeah. through there. Yeah, I think some of, those, some of those gaps are a bit on the big side, but hopefully you're aiming to catch fat eels. Well, it, it's a sort of eco trap, That's isn't right. it? The, the smaller, especially undersized th eels are going to escape. That's built in. Especially into designed to let the small eels escape. Yes, just as I thought. Well, if I catch any eels, Malcolm, you'll be the first to know. And if I don't catch any eels, you'll still be the first to know. <laughs> but thank you very much. With what can only be described as a work of art in tow, I'm off back home. You have got to keep your eye on the road along these windy country lanes, because there can be some very nasty accidents. want to miss one. The culinary potential of roadkill is much underrated. You've just got to ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, how flat is it? You've got to make sure that there's a little bit of decent meat on there. And this one may be a bit pancake, but there's still something on his thighs. The second factor is how fresh is it? Trust your nose. If it smells all right, it's almost certainly going to taste fine. This one may be in slightly mushy nick, but I'll find something to do with him. It's a pretty close call with my roadkill rabbit, but I've realized that after cutting away all the nasty bits, I'm barely gonna get myself a decent bunny burger. But all is not lost, because with the state he's in, he's going to make a perfect eel bait. Traditionally, eel traps were baited with sheep's entrails, but I'm guessing a roadkill rabbit will be just as tempting. The hungry eels should swim in through the mouth of the trap, pass through two no-return valves, and find themselves nabbed. And while my trap does its thing, I'm hoping to muscle in on a more communal harvest. Even in this season of abundance, in Dorset, nothing goes to waste. Behind this red brick wall lies a reservoir of autumn treasure. Around here, you don't eat apples, you drink them. And if they're all free, you drink as much as you like. The right to pick up these unwanted windfalls has been enthusiastically exercised by the Chiddock Cider Circle for as long as anyone can remember. So do you get excited when there's a stormy, windy night? You think, no, I don't want too many all at once, look. You don't want too many at once? Uh, not all at once. It doesn't take long to fill a bucket, does it? That's why you, that's why you got a small bucket. <laughs> I'm keen to help out in return for a taste of their infamous brew. But before I get so much as a sniff, I've got to show I can tell a good un from a bad un. What do you think of that one, Dennis? Uh, I, just I tell you this, you don't take your wife on that to bake for your supper tonight, do you? So why put it inside There you go. Fair enough. <laughs> Each week throughout the autumn, the circle collects around 50 bags of apples. Each bag makes three gallons of cider. 
on average we make about 1500 gallons but uh, one year we made 3000 on a very good year but it's usually about 1500 gallons a year to you and me that's 12000 free pints and it's not for the faint headed so just how strong is your brew dennis well, it, I think it varies a lot. Uh, what, 12, 13 percent? Yeah, something like that. Don't yeah. you get terrible hangovers? No, no, no hangover. No hangover with cider. You do with beer, but not with cider. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's Can a drink? promise, is it? Can it's you a promise. I can promise you that. However much I drink, no, no hangover guaranteed. No. Can you drink the two together? What, cider and beer? Yeah. Cider on beer makes you feel queer. Beer on cider makes you a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> My trusty trailer is loaded up with our pickings and then I give the boys a lift over to the cider house before heading home to rustle up a tasty offering to take with me to this evening's pressing. One of the things I've really been enjoying down here in Dorset is the easy-going barter economy and what better trade than an excess of food for an excess of alcohol. I thought I ought to take something substantial, something portable, something suitable for sating the appetite of heavy drinkers. I could have done sandwiches, obviously, but who wants a couple of flabby bits of bread with some wet filling in the middle? I always thought the Spanish had it absolutely sussed when they invented that fantastic picnic dish, the tortilla. To make an authentic tortilla, first fry up some roughly sliced onions. Let them soften to a golden brown to release their sweetness and then add parboiled potatoes, in my case, pink fir apples freshly dug from my garden. After a few minutes frying, chuck in a handful of chopped steamed spinach and a dozen lightly beaten eggs. Once the bottom and middle of the tortilla are set firm, it's time for some kitchen acrobatics. Got to turn it over. This is the risky bit. A little bit of double plate flipping action. Here we go. Exciting. Huh? The trouble is, a 12 egg tortilla is just too tubby to toss. But with the help of a large plate, the uncooked top becomes the bottom. Nice colour. Another flip, and the raw bit is on the top again. The frying pan goes over, and with a final turn, the bit that started on the top is now on the bottom. Got that? Tuesday night at the Cider House is strictly men only. It's when the real work of pressing the apples gets done. <laughs> it's also an ideal time to test the circle's promise that cider with an alcohol content of almost 14% won't give you a hangover. It's a simple process. The apples are roughly chopped and then passed through an electric wood shredder. They used to do the pulping by hand, but the machine has freed everyone's right arm for more important work. The shredded apples are then spread out on a cloth at the base of the ancient press. Once a layer eight inches deep has built up, the cloth is folded over and another one laid on top. When eight of these cakes are stacked up, you have a cheese. The chocks are knocked away and the pressing starts. Each cheese produces 150 gallons of pure apple juice. This torrent is then transferred into old oak barrels to be left for a couple of months to ferment into something a million miles away from anything you'd ever buy in screw-top bottles. And now for some grub. Dennis, try a slice of that. Oh, they're nice. Potatoes are they? Pink fur apple. I tell them to grow pink fur apple and they go on about a poncy potato. Yeah, they're wonderful po potato. Poncy but tasty. Oh, there you go. Love it. Cheers. God bless you. My poncy tortilla supplements the usual Tuesday night fare of bread and cheese and pickled onions. So when, when are the women allowed in? Saturdays and Sunday dinner times. So what happens if somebody's wife pops her head around the door and says it's time to come home? We go. <laughs> 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 Do 
you ever get to a point on a Tuesday night when you can't tell who's female and who's not? <laughs> well, I had me doubts about you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gather you're a bit of a hothead when it comes to Skittles. Because, you know, I quite fancy myself at Skittles. You do? Hmm. Right, well, I'll take you on for a couple of hands in a minute. Okay. Your dog well, got well, first, I'll tell you what. First, I'll take you on a pint of sweeter. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll, uh, I'll say five pounds of bacon against five gallons of cider. Right. We'll I do. can sink this before you. Right. Ready? Go. We're going double or quits at Skittles. <laughs> Ten gallons are riding on my last ball. <laughs> Strong stuff. So much for hangover free cider. Mind you, it's nothing that my morning chores won't sort out. It's always a great pleasure to come and feed the pigs. And I've really enjoyed watching them grow fat on the leftovers from my own kitchen and garden. Pretty good diet you've got there. The challenge of my first attempt at stock rearing has been to enjoy my pigs without losing sight of the reason I bought them, for food. I've had to make a point of not becoming too attached to them, because the hard truth is, in three weeks' time, these pigs are going to slaughter. I'll have mixed feelings, of course, when they finally go, but to be honest, I'm rather looking forward to the fantastic contribution they're going to make to my dwindling meat store. And in the meantime, I'm going to check on my sub-aqua fish store. Last night was the full moon. Perfect conditions for a good run of eels. This is where we find out if I'm having a fish supper or the vegetarian special. Oh. And it's fish. Two eels. One big, one small. That is a result. Look at that. Well, well done, Malcolm. And well done, my roadkill rabbit. As Malcolm based his eel trap on a French design from the Loire, I thought it would be nice to pay tribute with a classic French recipe. Eels in green herb sauce. First stop, chervil. Along with the chervil, I need a dozen or so lemony sorrel leaves, a bunch of parsley, and a fistful of my perpetual spinach. There are few jobs more satisfying than skinning an eel. A nail through the head and a firm grip with the pliers, and it slips off a treat. The base of this classic recipe is a slice of fried white bread. Some butter is added to the pan, and in go the chopped eel fillets. Eel is a fantastically rich meat, full of lovely fishy juices which are just oozing out at the moment into the oil and butter. And that's going to mix up with the herbs and a little bit of wine. Should be pretty nice. They don't take long to cook either. Three minutes and they're done. Into the juicy, oily pan go my chopped herbs. And once they've wilted for a couple of minutes, it's time to add a glass of dry white wine. 
Once that's simmered away and reduced to almost nothing, the pan comes off the heat for the finishing touches. A knob of butter followed by the yolk from one free-range river cottage egg. Then spoon this creamy herby mush over the eel fillets and eat without delay. Mmm, this is quite staggeringly good. And even better, because I can think to myself what a pleasure it is to have yet another free meal from my garden, my hen house, and in this case, most gratifyingly, my own little river. Autumn in Dorset provides many seasonal treats for the larder, and one of my favourite meats is just coming into season. I haven't managed to procure an invitation to join one of Dorset's exclusive pheasant shoots as a gun, but there are other ways of getting your hands on some birds. On the wettest day since I moved down here, I'm out for a stroll in the country as a beater on a nearby shoot. Our job is to flush the pheasants from the cover at the top of the hill so they fly out over the guns at the bottom. Dorset, with its wooded hills and deep valleys, is ideal pheasant shooting country. So how many birds are in this bit of ground here? Maybe two, three hundred. Really? Yeah. And how many of those do you think they'll shoot? Four. <laughs> Head on to piece of string. Or how short? <laughs> Pete Whitlock has been beating here for the last 16 years. That kale is brilliant at getting you completely soaking yeah. wet, isn't it? It's the trouble is you're wet through in five minutes and you've got to stay wet all the rest of the day, yeah. which isn't no fun. Would you rather be up here beating or down there with a gun in your hand? Oh, rather be beating. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good fun, good banter, good trade. I can see what Pete's on about. At least we're not paying in the region of a grand for the privilege of standing still for six hours in the rain. But Derek Purchase, the gamekeeper, is a hard taskmaster. On the last of the day's five drives, he marches us down to the bottom of the hill and then he marches us up again. We've covered at least ten miles today and I'm completely shattered. Still, it's all part of the day's work and flushing the birds from so high up makes them extremely difficult to hit, which is just what the paying guns like to see. At last, Derek brings the proceedings to a close. Time for a cup of tea. <sighs> now you've done a half day, you're gonna, when are you going to do the full one? You call that a half day? Yeah. Well, we just sort of ease you into it at the start. That was the most exhausting day I've had for a long while. The going rate for a day's beating is 15 quid. I've converted that into pheasants, and at a wholesale rate of exchange, it feels like a pretty good deal. The pheasants have been hanging for five days and I've invited three of the beaters over for dinner. Three burly men with hearty appetites. I've got just the thing for them, a dinky little game terrine. Mine will be made of pheasant, pigeon and rabbit. People think of terrines as time-consuming and difficult, but actually they're quite straightforward. Just think of it as building a wall. All you need is bricks and mortar. My bricks are all the prime cuts from my game, nicely browned. My mortar consists of sausage meat with a couple of handfuls of breadcrumbs and one whole egg. The egg and breadcrumbs are vital because that way the mortar expands to fill all the cracks. And as long as that happens, you can't go wrong. With the base of the mortar sorted, I'm adding richness and flavour with the chopped livers from the pheasants, pigeons and rabbits. Then some aromatics, thyme, parsley and chopped garlic. Whole juniper berries make little time bombs of taste and finally a good splosh each of brandy and red wine. Now build that wool. In a tin lined with streaky bacon, start with a layer of the forcemeat. 
The first bricks to go down are the pheasant breasts. Then another layer of force meat. And then the pigeon breasts go in. The great thing about using these three different coloured game meats is that when you finally slice through the terrine, you get a beautiful marbled mosaic. Should be enough to bring an appreciative tear to the eye of even the toughest Dorset beater. I hope. Finished with a layer of rabbit and then force meat, the terrine is sealed with more streaky bacon, covered with foil, and then baked in a dish of hot water in a moderate oven for two hours. Good evening, gentlemen. Come on in. My guests arrive bang on time, and I'm anxious to see what they'll make of my beautifully marbled, if rather dainty, terrine. There you go. Hey. hey. <laughs> That's posh. Thank you. <laughs> Looks very nice. Yeah. That's so funny, Pete. <laughs> well, I just laugh at anything you want to do. <laughs> so what, are, what have we got? Yeah, this is day. purely pheasant. No, it isn't. It's pheasant and rabbit, top and bottom. Yeah. And a little bit of pigeon in the middle. Oh, All right. right. Pigeon. Pigeon. So that we get the different coloured meats in the same. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's delicious. Yeah, very nice. Mm. Very nice. Oh, there's a bit of a pregnant pause there, wasn't there? No, no. Very nice. Very nice. Mm -hmm. You cook yourself, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> tin, of, tin of beans and a bit of toast, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> it's quite mm. tough. Yeah, I've never had pigeon in a pot. I haven't had a casserole. Yeah. Like, chucks it all in together. And... The pheasant and the pigeon <laughs> together. <laughs> when you're eating at the same time. Mm. You like that? Mm. Very yeah, nice. Wash it down with a drop of beer. Very different, all mm. the same. Let me, um, yes, please. Okay. Anybody still hungry, or have you all had enough? Oh, oh very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Couldn't you. eat anything else. Oh yes, well, probably could. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Depends. I'll see what I can rustle up. God, I'll eat up here. That's even better. Now you're talking. Now you're talking, boys. <laughs> The boys help themselves to a pheasant each as I bring out the veg. And with the help of the extra rations, the evening ends on a seasonal high. <laughs> Oh, my God.